everyone, and welcome to the TDWI webinar program. I'm Andrew Miller, and I'll be your moderator. For today's program, we're going to talk about using data mesh to advance distributed data access, agility, and governance. And our sponsor today is Dremio. For our presentations today, we'll hear first from David Stoddard with TDWI. And after Dave speaks, we'll be joined by Nick Atchison with Dremio for a presentation and a fireside chat. And our first speaker today is David Stoddard. He's the Senior Director of Research for Business Intelligence at TWI. As an analyst, writer, and researcher, Dave has provided thought leadership on key topics in BI, analytics, IT, and information management for over two decades. Previously, he headed up his own independent firm and served as Vice President and Research Director with Ventana Research. He was the founding Chief Editor of Intelligent Enterprise and served as Editorial Director there for nine years. With TDWI Research, Dave focuses on providing research-based insight and best practices for organizations implementing BI, analytics, performance management, and related technologies and methods. With that, welcome, Dave, and I will pass it over to you. Thanks a lot, Andrew. And welcome, everybody. I think we got a good webinar topic today, and welcome to Nick as well. I think we're going to have a good discussion uh, after I present. And um, so... Let's talk about, uh, we're, today we're going to talk about using data mesh to advance distributed data access, agility, and governance. And those are certainly three issues that we see in our research, uh, improving data access, having agility to handle new uh, environments, new requirements, and then, of course, addressing governance issues. And so I'm going to give some TWI perspectives to top it off here, and then we'll get into our discussion later. Um, <clears throat> so just to think about some of the key trends that are driving this that we see in our research is certainly data democratization i think you know it could be at the top uh, that's where organizations are trying to empower lots of people in their organization uh, to do more with data to have a more uh, effective and satisfactory and uh, you know positive experience in using data to make decisions uh, to take actions in their business operations and so Data-driven decision, data-informed decisions, uh, all depends on having more complete views of the data. And organizations are really bumping into this, is that they, they have a lot of silos, which I'll get into, and so it makes it difficult to get that all the data, all the relevant data about customers, about products, about their markets, and things like that that are important. So certainly 73% saying enabling data users to do more on their own is extremely or very important to uh, everyone in our research. So it's, you know, a top of mind thing here. So um, innovations and ease of use are very important. We've had, a, you know, a long time now of self-service innovations in business intelligence and analytics and a lot of front end tools, which has certainly made, created quite an appetite for data in organizations. And now we're getting into augmented BI. So using artificial intelligence, machine learning to augment dashboards, uh, other kinds of interfaces, portals that users are working with to understand data. So there's a lot more that's coming uh, that's happening right now, a lot of innovation. So analytics and AI machine learning, they're, they're everywhere now. And um, so in the augmented BI, there of course data science and a lot of advanced analytics and, uh, and also seeing it in applications. So I have here embedded in operational applications. And so this is an interesting trend as well embedding more advanced, so getting beyond just dashboards and reports and applications that actually having uh, analytics and uh, AI and machine learning kind of embedded in there to, to again, improve decisions, improve automated decisions. Uh, so speed to insight for all of these kinds of applications is really critical. Uh, it's gotta be speed in to support analytics. You know, it used to be that analytics kind of ran in batch and was sort of done when there were some spare, spare uh, processing time, but that's not the case anymore. It's just too strategic too strategic now. And so, of course, we're getting, now getting into the age of generative AI and uh, large language models. And so this is going to put even more pressure on organizations to figure out how can they make more of their data available and get complete views, complete data uh, to run such uh, kinds of uh, systems. So there's a lot of urgency to modernize, uh, urgency to modernize to address these challenges. Pressure to modernize data management, uh, to think beyond, to think different, to quote Steve Jobs, um, beyond legacy systems. So beyond the sort of the barriers of the legacy systems, legacy data warehouses, uh, legacy kind of monolithic systems that are in place. And how can you take more and fuller advantage of say cloud data platforms, which are have elasticity, uh, better scalability. You can size them up, size them down as needed. 
Uh, this is a you know great advantage. There and of course there's increasing distributed distributed quality sort of hybrid multi cloud, which I'll talk about. Um, so how but how to you know look at that not as a problem but as a, as a potential advantage. And so to take advantage of what you can do in the cloud, um, agility on demand through the elasticity. So democratization often does demand that as you get new new groups of users, new project teams, uh, new uh, requirements. Uh, of course, we're in, we've seen well enough in the last few years how things can change very quickly. And so things that are kind of set in stone and assumptions made about how to approach a market uh, change, you know, radically. And so it needs to have a lot of flexibility uh, and expectation of that kind of change in the system rather than having to rewrite the system every time. Disparate data is a big challenge though. 38% saying data silos make access too difficult. 41% citing problems for analytics to understand data relationships is pretty fundamental to a lot of analytics is to understand the relationship between different types of data to get different perspectives on that kind of relationship. Hybrid, as I mentioned, on-premises and cloud, very common, so it's getting even harder. You know, in some ways, organizations are trying to consolidate into the cloud, but they have lots of silos, and then it's very easy to spin up cloud systems, and so <clears throat> there's often more silos created in the cloud, as we're seeing in our research. So the delays, there's a lot of redundancy, a lot of copying data, replicating data, and, and so it's difficult for management and government perspective to keep track of all that, increasing errors, and so it's difficult for organizations to really keep a control. And of course, a lot of this adds up to more costs as well. Delays and spotty governance um, is, is a difficult problem. So it kind of goes together with management is to be able to govern both the defensive side, which is sensitive data protection, the personally identifiable information, other kinds of financial information that might be circulating around the organization and want to be able to protect that from uh, you know the wrong people accessing it and of course, according to a lot of regulations, particularly around PII, uh, need to do it and need to, to uh, report on it and have audits about uh, whether you're protecting that data effectively. So that's the defensive side. And the offensive side is really around trust, data trust, quality, complete, complete data, having consistent data, accurate data, uh, making sure that's fit for purpose. So if you're doing you know, financially oriented reporting, very accurate, snapshots have to be very accurate. Maybe analytics can be where you want, you know, more of the uh, original quality of the data. So things like that. So data, data trust and data quality are, are not one thing, but uh, not one size fits all, but have to be coordinated with the, the actual purpose. And so that's the offensive side and can be complex. So, and then organizations are facing the labyrinth as I think, um, you know, some are calling it, it's a good name for it, really, the complex data pipelines, uh, ETL processes, now ELT processes, a lot of transformation of the data, preparing of the data, um, all the actions that need to be done. And so this, again, to, to be fit for purpose, this is becoming very complex in organizations, thousands of routines often going on. It can add up to slow data movement, uh, co competition between the routine, routines, or dependencies that you may not be aware of, like where you're waiting for until process to finish be able to, before you can start another one. Um, so these are issues that create slow data movement, uh, expensive um, data governance exposures because you're moving a lot of data around. Metadata chaos is a problem too. Is all, all these systems, a lot of BI systems, the different data platforms have their own metadata. It's difficult to get that kind of complete view of, and, and collect all of the data metadata together. And this is something that we see organizations uh, dealing with as they're interested in data catalogs, but in some ways they often have too many data directories, data catalogs, glossaries, and things like that, and can't knit it all together. A lot of pressure on the users then to get their hands dirty, to, to they themselves try to learn the intricacies of accessing the data that they need, uh, finding it, and uh, being able to do it in a repeatable way. Um, so this is uh, an issue in organizations. So now that I've talked to us about some of the challenges, let's ask our audience um, what, what our audience is seeing here in terms of challenges. So the question is, what is your organization's biggest challenge regarding distributed data? And uh, we're certainly aware that it's probably maybe all of these, but maybe you can pick, uh, select one or more options from this list is really the top of mind things that are the biggest challenges. So the first is enabling users to easily access, query, and analyze distributed data. So, which is really the, one of the main purposes we're here today. So disparate data management, we cannot optimize costs and performance. So it's, it's just kind of getting out of the, out of the uh, capabilities of governance 
cost management, data management uh, to, to handle it. Ensuring data governance to protect an inventory sensitive data. So the PII uh, often driven by regulatory uh, requirements, uh, not able to get, stay on top of that, that being the biggest challenge. Data quality problems, too much duplication and inconsistency. So as I mentioned, that sort of offensive side of what people are sort of grouping together into the totality of data governance today, the, that side of it, to uh, improve the quality, consistency, accuracy of the data, reduce duplication and inconsistency, that being a problem. Slow and costly data movement, copying and replication, so that labyrinth I mentioned uh, that slows things down, <clears throat> makes it difficult to get the speed to insight that organizations need. And then other. So if there is one that we haven't mentioned, uh, you could fill it in there and we'll see it in the Q&A portion at the end. Use the ask a question box. Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, I might refresh this one time to make sure we're going to get everybody. All right, so the early polling <laughs> telling us that um, just over half uh, is enabling users to access data. And a third, well, we actually we get 70% saying uh, data quality problems, a third saying data governance. And um, I think we do have everybody, so I don't need to refresh it, but let's take a look. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to sort of write some of these down. So, uh, yeah, we get a third, but really the majority talking about data quality problems. We do see, in fact, from the research I just completed, data quality is really a top concern still in organizations and uh, a difficult one to deal with. All right, great, thank you. So let's talk about solving the challenges. And uh, so I'm gonna lay out three things that we'll be talking about in our discussion. So just to kind of get these out on the table. One is the data lakehouse trend, uh, is to try to consolidate the data, uh, move away from certainly the two-tier approach, which organizations, many organizations have with the data warehouse and the data lake, but of course they have other data silos, data marts, multiple uh, data lakes, sometimes multiple data warehouses out there. So the data lakehouse is to bring it together into one data repository, a single staging tier. So not having separate staging, ETL staging areas, but beginning to pull it closer to the target platform in the data and be able to use that processing effectively. So make use of low cost object store to capture all this, all of the data, semi unstructured structured data, the ability to, to apply the data warehouse structure schema and transformations to the data pretty much as it's needed for BI reporting, for BI dashboards, uh, but also for the more specialized things you're trying to do with analytics to make it more uh, fit for purpose to have that flexibility and then leaving data formats unchanged if needed, uh, as in a data lake, uh, for advanced analytics and AI machine learning can do the structure on read approach. So have the flexibility, but all have it together rather than disparate platforms. Open data lakehouse is an important trend to be able to use standardization so you can have portability, to be able to move from different platform to platform. Um, and again, not having to force the, the users to know all the data, different the distinct table formats, the storage formats, and also to expand, as I mentioned, the applications to be able to support things like asset transactions, related functions like that, um, and then using metadata effectively. So metadata often be very much in the center of the data lakehouse and open data lakehouse. And so we see in our research, 32% are currently using a data lakehouse. So this is happening and 36% plan to use. So this is a very important trend to be, try to just bring all the platforms together. And then there are the distributed approaches, so data mesh, which of course is a, the major topic we're going to talk about uh, in our webinar today. Decentralized data mesh, uh, emphasizing here, I see it almost as like a, a people, well, it is identified really as a people and process uh, thought, really, is a domain oriented decentralized ownership. So you have domains in your organization, finance, marketing, sales, um, and there's always been this friction between this, their centralized sort of IT gener enterprise uh, command of the data and the domains that are trying to have their own data and often are setting up these data silos and their own data systems. And so this is a system where you're trying to, I, I see it as acknowledging that really, that you're not dependent on the central platform, that you're encouraging self-service, that self-service is sort of built into the data infrastructure of the platform. The illustration here talking about the four things uh, set out domain, so domain ownership, uh, and um, grouping data according to the, those domains, as I mentioned, and then uh, managing the domains, you know, in, in those, managing the data, I should say, in those domains. And so uh, really trying to decentralize it and really use the centralization of, say, governance where necessary. Um, and also the emphasis on the idea of developing data as a product. So 
uh, connecting the data producers more directly to the data consumers and not having that, that labyrinth as much, the interface, or rather the, the, the complexity there uh, that makes it so difficult to sort of pull these together, under identifying the owners, so sources have owners, and using the infrastructure where you need it to, to develop cross-functional teams to develop the products uh, as necessary. And then federated computational governance, so being able to use uh, modern techniques uh, to spread governance and use it in a federated approach rather than have a top-down centralized governance where everybody has to understand it, um, often read the manuals and comply with it, but using uh, automated constraints as they see it um, to improve uh, distribution of the governance uh, as necessary to the users. So data observability being very important too, to improve the product quality and data protection. In other words, having good monitoring, modernizing the monitoring, using AI in, in the monitor to see where there are bottlenecks, see where things are affecting the, the end product and how you can sort of track it back and begin to improve processes uh, to make it work. So we see in our research, this is just research that we'll be publishing in about a month, 21% currently using a data mesh architecture, 38% plan to use the data mesh. So definitely seeing a lot of interest being generated, 38% planning to use is, is uh, interesting there and already 21% using the data mesh. Data fabric is another big topic of discussion. So here, um, architecturally, about, again, reducing friction, the connection between distributed data analytics processes, using data virtualization. So the concept of a layer uh, to provide that single point of access, often single point of, of governance to all the distributed data that, that's uh, the sort of data virtualization approach. But again, you know, about Fabric being out there to knit this together, but also empowering the different uh, domains to, to borrow from the data mesh terminology. Metadata is central to this. And so being able to collect all of that metadata and build on the metadata to build more knowledge out there for to be shared to make it easier to identify the right data, to connect to the data, uh, to enrich the data as needed. So do all the, the pre preparation processing as needed across the fabric. Semantic enrichment, so uh, enriching beyond the metadata and again, using more knowledge, shared knowledge, maybe even crowdsourced knowledge about the data, about different data sets, and then faster, so speed. So a lot of automation built into the data fabric uh, to make a faster discovery of the data relationships um, and as part of analytics. And so we do see here 27% currently using a data fabric architecture, 42% planning to use. Uh, so again, pretty strong interest, uh, I'd say current use uh, as well uh, for really kind of a newer concept. So we'll be talking about these in our discussion portion. So just to conclude my presentation, it's about, you know, number one, trying to make it easier for those democratized users, make it easier and pr productive to access and explore distributed data overcome the silo limits, uh, make the right choice there about how to handle the silos. Uh, and we'll be talking about that again in our, in our discussion uh, and the difficulties of integrating the data. So empowering users. So that should be really be a high priority as you look at solutions for this. Improving holistic governance. So governance is critical. Uh, governance along with the data management, along with the ability to have data observability, or so modernizing the monitoring and understanding kind of the end-to-end -end connection of things. So improving that. And then understanding how the options differ and we will be discussing this data mesh, uh, people and process focus, the domain empowerment, very important, as you want to you know, empower lots of users, democratize users to be effective with the data, data fabric, in, in increasing the automation, using the connections between things to uh, reduce costs, reduce complexity. The self-driving car, to quote Gartner, I think is a good term for where it wants to go uh, in terms of automation. So we'll be discussing this to come. All right, Andrew, with, okay, we've got one more poll question here and then we'll hand it off to Andrew to uh, introduce Nick. So here we asked before about the challenges, this is about what are you doing? So the strategy to increase the value of distributed data. So which of the following is are most important aspects of your strategy? And again, pick one or more uh, that are top of mind. So one is to use the data virtualization or federation technology. So trying to build out that layer leave the data where it is rather than move a lot of the data and do a lot of consolidation that way. Uh, so using that layer effectively to access, to govern the data uh, for lots of different purposes. Create a decentralized data mesh architecture. So talking about the, the domain importance and recognize that and uh, improving the experience, uh, the data experiences of, of the domains and also their uh, you know, self-service self capabilities. Uh, develop a data fabric. So 
using a lot of uh, effective automation, using data virtualization, using uh, the, the network idea to try to pull that together. So it's C and then D, consolidate by moving data from disparate silos to a single platform. So I mentioned that we see a lot of that in our research, a trend to try to consolidate data silos into by moving the data to uh, a single platform, such as a data lake house. And um, next would be maximizing the metadata management catalogs and semantic integration across distributed data. So this is frankly important to all of these, but I want to see how important this is to our audience today. And then finally, not sure, uh, still investigating options. Uh, and I'm sure that's partly why you're here today. So let's take a look at their answers. And uh, so we can see again yeah, across the board, looking at it, 60%, 60.7% uh, maximizing metadata. Uh, excellent, yeah, that's a very important one. 42% consolidating by moving the data distributed silos, 25% developing the data fabric, 28.6% um, the data mesh, so slightly more on the data mesh, and then a quarter also looking at data virtualization. And uh, we do have 17.9% saying still, or almost 18% uh, investigating. Okay, fantastic. Okay, we'll be talking about all of these things as we get to our discussion. Uh, Andrew, how it back to you. Thank you very much, Dave. That was a great presentation. This does bring me to our next speaker, who's Nick Atchison with Dremio. Nick is a senior product and strategy leader at Dremio. He has delivered digital and technology transformations at massive scale at organizations such as Nike, Zendesk, AEO, Philips, and the NSA. Prior to joining Dremio, he was the CDO at Ankara, which was acquired by Databricks. With that, welcome Nick, and I will pass it over to you now. Hey guys, thanks for having me. Um, so I said, let's, let's jump in real quick. I just want to give a kind of a very fast high level of Dremio. Again, these slides are going to be available to you, and if you learn more, feel free to check us out or reach out at any time. So uh, to really understand Dremio, I think you know, taking a step back and looking at the, the history from the data analytics perspective is probably the best way to understand like where do we come from and why are we here? Uh, so I think it, you know, as we looked at the old world of enterprise data warehouses, frankly, old world, although many of you are still dealing with the Teradatas and Oracles and trying to figure out how to manage that modernization effort, right? You had all this fixed compute storage capacity, right? Still mostly on-prem, very hard to manage, right? And I think as we hit that world of the Hadoop ecosystem, right, what we really started seeing now is best of breed and open source really starting to come to the forefront, right? The problem though, is you start still having this fixed compute storage capacity, right? You're still mostly on-prem, but frankly, it was even harder to manage, right? I think um, back at the NSA in one of our use cases, we had about a 70 person team just managing a use case, right? And some of the other enterprises I've worked at, you had massive teams and organizations just doing some of your map R jobs. So although these tools were coming out, you really started seeing this best of breed, you're still fairly locked into this ecosystem and it's still hard, right? It wasn't really, I think Snowflake was probably one of the, the big key drivers along with the overall cloud movement is moving to that cloud data warehouse, right? So I mentioned Snowflake because their ability to be able to separate storage and compute while also enabling folks to be cloud agnostic. Uh, I believe I was the second enterprise uh, customer of Snowflake from the, the, the size perspective uh, while I was at Nike and it just blew up, right? So. However, the cost prohibitive, right? I think Snowflake still has 155% net dollar retention, which really means 55% of all of their accounts are going over budget, All right? So there's, they're still trying to get this hold on of, can I still scale this, right? Is it gonna be cost prohibitive, even though I'm meeting business needs, but now you're still stuck in, in a lot of these proprietary systems, right? And you're limited to their individual processing engines. So even though you want it to be agnostic and open, you're still kind of getting locked in. Right, and I think the the material change happened here, right, with this data lake house. You know, we had this classic, you know, moving data into warehouse, right, optimizing for analytics workloads. Um, but I think this data lake house movement has materially changed how we think about um, data and the interaction of it, right? Because I think my favorite example I give is when I was at Zendesk, we had over 250 SaaS applications powering Zendesk, but over 80 of them we're managing and, and utilizing data and visualizations and so forth, all within their own platforms, right? So how do you have even enough integrations and how do you manage that across an ecosystem? Um, so I think this lake house, especially with some of the technologies that come out, such as like with Dremio, uh, 
delivering and um, donating to the open source community with Arrow is now you actually don't need to move all of your data workloads into a warehouse. You're getting warehouse speed directly on your lake, right? So you, now we have much more open table formats and this no copy and zero ETL trend is massively blowing up that we're seeing out there, right? You don't have to have so much proliferation of your data across an ecosystem. And you still get now best of breed processing engines. So you get to deliver data faster, right? Insights faster at a fraction of the cost. But what we see moving forward is the data lake house 2.0, we like to call tied in with mesh based principles. So, you know, between gen AI, you know, capabilities, you're really starting to continue to see this autonomous, even lake house, not just semantic layer. And, um, with Nessie that we have recently donated to the open source community, we're also looking at treating data as code, especially when you look at principles of data mesh with what does it mean to treat data as a product, which is unique to be able to differentiate data as a product versus data products. And I'm happy to expand on that if anybody wants to uh, later on as we get into mesh. So I, I love Dave's orientation of the labyrinth. I may steal that one um, around the complex pipelines and ETLs, but this is what most people's environments look like, right? You have data copies, you have integrations everywhere, right? Skyrocketing costs in each of these individual platforms. You're paying multiple times for storage. You're paying multiple times to land copies of data. You're continuing to create new versions of that data, right? And it's just, it's near impossible to be able to govern this ecosystem. So, you know, self-service in that basically just means a data scientist, for example, will build their own pipeline to run their own model. And as we know, that's normally the biggest vulnerability within your ecosystem because they're not data engineers. But guess what? We still need to deliver it to the business. So the, the fun here is like, there just has to be a better way, right? And that's really where Dremio fits in. With Dremio and, and generally with the lake house movement, you get that easy and open architecture at one tenth of the cost within your ecosystem, right? Because there's no data copies. Uh, one of my favorite examples here is MSK. Uh, they were initially looking to do federation and what they found out right off their implementation was, wait, I could probably decrease 90% of my Kafka spend, right? and immediately found about four engineers worth of time just by doing the initial federation use case. We're not even talking about moving into the lake house yet. And then the, the efficiencies that they gain there from their warehouse offloads. Uh, same thing with Shell, being able to get 14 data engineers time worth of capacity back. And because again, there's no complex ETL pipeline management, right? Governance becomes much easier now because you're managing over top of effectively at times abstracted data sources from your end user. Because now you're starting to register these data sets one time available to anyone without having to move it across all those different platforms. So again, you get data consistency and quality becomes much easier. Now you start to have better conversations around things like data contracts, right? And then understanding ownership because those, the data sets are getting registered by people and by business users. So Jumbo makes that a lot easier. And my, my fun here is always looking at the back end of what makes these things so powerful, having the capabilities like reflections so where you're not querying whole data sets, right? So reflections effectively are like materialized views, um, but much more powerful within the Dremio ecosystem to be able to speed up your query performance without having to hit direct operational systems. Um, and then with Arctic, you know, being able to treat data as code so we go back to the, what does it mean to be able to manage data products? Well, part of that is being able to deliver a Git-like experience within your data. So um, that is an open preview capability that we have today, but being able to not just manage your Arctic and not um, lake house, and not just being able to manage you know, your iceberg ecosystem, but continuing to provide much more functionality than a classic catalog would provide you. So again, real quick, because everybody always wants to know, who do you work with? Are you big enough? Um, so Dremio, uh, we are the only data lake house with a integrated semantic layer directly within our platform. Uh, your data forever, no lock-in. Um, this is not a scenario where a we have an open source you know, tool such as, oh, maybe I will not name, <laughs> um, but it's not really open source, right? For us, we are fully committed uh, we have donated Apache Arrow, which has over 70 million downloads a month. We are key contributors to Iceberg. Um, and as mentioned, you know, most of our innovation that we're driving inside Dremio 
are actually continuing to open source that with a lot of our unique capabilities that we're providing to you is really around the, the UI and making the experience easier and making sure that things just work, right? So you get that sub-second performance at that tenth of a classic warehouse cost. And as you continue to look at your ecosystems and efficiency, the total cost of ownership within Dremio continues to pay for itself within your first use case. So, um, and again, we have thousands of companies across different industries adopting us uh, using our technology, and we have five of the Fortune 10 companies today as customers. So, um, back over to you, Andrew. Let's say let's have a good conversation. Terrific. Yeah, thank you very much, Nick. That was a fantastic presentation. It's now time for the fireside chat, so I'll ask that Dave rejoin us. And Dave, I'll pass it back over to you to begin the discussion. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Uh, again, welcome, Nick. That was a great presentation. Um, so let's let's talk about maybe a, to top it off the the um, sorting things out the data mesh, data fabric, data virtualization. Uh, what are some of the differences? You, you talked to some of them in your presentation, but I think it'd be great to get some more understanding of that. Yeah, no, and uh, my, my joke over here whenever I'm chatting with prospects, friends, or, or customers is I try not to use these buzzwords and talk about more about the actual patterns underneath of them. Um, yeah. That said, I'm happy to talk about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, as I mentioned, you know, back at Nike, we were actually building a data fabric without really knowing what that meant yet and before Jamak's book came out on data mesh. And part of the, the principles that we looked at were hey, can we make sure that every single data event that's happening in our ecosystem is a visible, auditable, right? And, and that we can continue to manage that. And that was a North Star. You find out really fast that no platform in the world has an amount of connectors of an enterprise, you know, I'll even say a Fortune 2000 company. Um, so I think this is where we started to break away from data fabric, but looked at it as, are the fundamental principles available, right? Can I pub sub? Um, each of those events, or can I at least bulk load them so I can then minimally start modeling the interactions with, with data post, post event, right? So getting past that, I need spectrum visibility real time to going, well, how do I manage my ecosystem? So I think data fabric is that North star to go, everything's connected. You have full visibility. There are single sources of truth, right? But the reality is it's just not possible. Um, or it's not possible in any amount of time or funding that's reasonable. So I think that's where you get to data mesh. And with data mesh, I think the first the first step all day with data mesh, in, and the same thing with Fabric, is that virtualization piece, right? Can I actually connect and solve the first problem, which is access and insight, right? And can I do that fast? What a lot of folks end up finding, though, as they do that is, well, what about the performance now? And I think that's where you start differentiating you know, federation capabilities. And then as you move into mesh, this is the part where you're going, well, how now, now how am I thinking about the actual ownership of these assets? Now that they're in production, right? How am I continuing to treat them as an asset, right? Mm -hmm. And part of that goes, you can't serve everyone across the enterprise. I, I think anywhere I've ever worked, I've had, you know, three quarters, four quarters of roadmaps and I can't serve half the business and you have to prioritize. And it's not okay, right? So I think that's the part where I think data mesh is so powerful, but companies need to be able to move from a nice to have to need to have of a data mesh, which means mm -hmm. you have to apply key business cases to mesh and continue to prove that out, like a customer 360 or supply chain analytics, for example. So I think data virtualization is always the first step. Mesh is the first piece towards continued value of being able to run that at scale um, and I think Fabric's always going to be the North Star is, can I connect this better? Right. And um, you, you mentioned data as a product and data products. I had to get your view on that because you <laughs> put that out there. <laughs> so, because that's a good yeah. topic. Um, yeah, yeah I, uh, I'll be honest with you. I, I continue to struggle with this one because I didn't really understand the people that were asking the question of, Hey, Nick, you keep talking about data as an asset. You keep talking about data products. Aren't they just the same thing? Or is it just a table view? Um, mm -hmm. And it really clicked for me a few months ago to, I think, to tell the story a little better is separate the two. What does it mean to create uh, a data product, which is probably an easier part of that, right? What people think about there is to go, hey, can, you know, what's the value of the data that I have today? And is that a data product? Is it a dashboard? Right. In some cases, yeah, I've actually built data product teams and it was Tableau dashboards, right? They were, they were solving key business decisions 
And to be clear, not every dashboard or not every table, right, is a product. You treat that differently. But a data product in this case, right, it is solving a key business problem and it or it is being monetized. Right? Hmm. So if you think about the report or frankly the end table of an output of all of the work that you do prior to that, that becomes the data product. I think when you treat data as a product, there is a material break of that, which really means like, well, how do you manage products the same way you would manage software that you sell to a business? And if you think about that on the domain level of marketing domain, right, or sales domain or product domain, right, part of that is go, like, how do I assure that there's actually quality in what I'm doing? And quality then leads into contracts, right? Whether that's SLAs, OLAs, or you continue around, around that. Hmm. But also there, there's ownership, right? Who owns this product? Uh, or a domain, right? And then there's the fun piece of like, as you mature, what's the roadmap of that? Am I adding more data to this domain? What happens when I add data to that? Because we all know that people star select, uh, <laughs> export <laughs> out and then create reports off of it. So you know, you're going to have to be able to roll back those changes and so forth. And I think this is some of the fun that I've seen with Jemio and part of why I came here is going like, what does it mean to be able to do that? It's, it's starting to think about data as code and managing your data the same way you would a product um, whether that is the end state product or not, it's thinking about the domain itself and the data itself and what it means to be able to treat data as a product versus going, hey, go explore. And that materially changes how you think about and interact with data sets. I hope that yeah. helps. Yeah, no, I think that's great. That, that's really helpful. And it, it explains you know, some of the built-in uh, processes in data mesh uh, to improve pro the, the product and um, and how they all kind of fit together that's important. Yeah. Um, uh, there's cool stuff happening around there, right? Around even just you know semantic layer with Gen AI being able to immediate create like a wiki experience, right? Or data catalog experience. And I think there's a lot of a lot of cool stuff coming around, but it's more of, hey, what's the maturity of that look like? And I think that's the where mm -hmm. the product orientation comes around versus just like the auto curation of these things that aren't really managed. Hmm. Well, why don't we talk about the role of metadata uh, metadata catalogs, business glossary, semantic layer, um, which is really important in all of these things. Uh, but, and I think in your chart, you for for Dremio, you showed uh, the importance of it with the unified semantic layer. Um, so, what are you seeing? You know, based on your experience, uh, the value of that and how to make it more valuable and what its role should be. Yeah. So, I think I'll separate the semantic layer first because I think that might be a little bit easier. Because um, I think we talk about catalog and glossary, that becomes more mm -hmm. around the management and uh, operationalization of data itself, right? But the semantic layer is more on the actual usage and making it easy to use the data. Um, and I think my, my favorite example here is like Databricks, right? Databricks is amazingly powerful and an awesome tool to be able to do analytics pipeline management, right? Uh, anyone doing Spark out there, if you're not on Databricks, you know what the headache that is, right? Um, but you know, what does it look like now to interact with data, right? Try to use, you know, DB SQL um, if you're not a hardcore engineer. Uh, and most of the time you end up utilizing a platform like at scale, right? And there's additional costs that runs in there because you do need that semantic layer. Um, and it's not just for ease of use, right? Because ease of use transfers from as an analyst to as a business user, right? So, <laughs> and then where does the actual semantic or business logic live? Should that live in one place or should that live, you know, uh, within individual tools, right? And I think most of the folks out here that probably live in Tableau as that example, right? When you lose an analyst uh, or they leave the company, you know, how do you continue to pull that out and apply some of that logic into different use cases? Or the same thing is giving it to a data scientist versus an analyst versus a business user. So being able to centralize those capabilities into an easy to use platform through one space is amazingly powerful and extremely useful. And I think that's why a lot of companies go, fine, I, I will bring in another company just to do semantic layer. Uh, so, you know, with Jeremy, obviously we're, we're, we have a fully integrated one. I think on the metadata catalog, um, I think data catalog overall is a very interesting topic, right? But with metadata uh, management, that's just one part of the data catalog, right? And not only that, you need business level metadata as much as you need systems level metadata. So being able to manage both of those and to do that dynamically with like AI powered, uh, like most folks can say they do AI powered, but it's really just providing PII examples of, I think this might look like a social security number, 
right? right. <laughs> when you get into better things around like active metadata uh, around your systems and applying mm -hmm. that and integrating that with, with business level metadata, you're seeing a lot of really cool platforms come out. Um, like I think like Atlan is doing that one the right way. And then there's the other part with business glossary, right? If you talk to folks that are running catalogs, most of them will like have some version of Calibra. Calibra is amazing with business glossary, but good luck <clears> with embedded <throat> well, metadata management. This is why so many enterprises have multiple catalogs within their data catalog. True. Yeah, uh, and you know some of the duties are like uh, data lineage and data curation. I mean, we talked about you know part of that labyrinth is is uh, trying to pull that together uh, as, as you take from sources to the sort of finished state, I guess, uh, so that the data is usable. Um, so. What do you see the you know the role I guess of the semantic layer, uh, but uh, all these other technologies for getting to that data preparation stage, uh, getting through it? Yeah, um, I think the data prep one, or even just you know think about data enrichment in general, is a another one of those rabbit holes we can probably talk hours on. We um, could, and but part of this piece is you know being able to do the work easy right you see dbt flying everywhere right because it's just it's much mm -hmm. easier for someone to curate their own data um or normalize yeah. that or model that directly over a source but the other part of that like as being part of a central team like and owning those platforms in my past you're also creating mini marks everywhere right and like what does it mean to then govern that that enrichment and modeling you know over time and I think those are the challenges I think you're going to see in the next year or two. Um, as much as I love DBT, I, you know, I brought it in myself to companies. Uh, but like, how are you continuing to think about, again, data as a product um, when you have so much you know, federation of capability across an enterprise? Um, so I think there's a lot of you know, being very intentional about what does it mean to be able to treat different layers of sensitive data right, and that access you've got to be able to connect back into that, you know, that metadata management or go, is there a simpler way to do this? Can I put some workloads there or not? Um, I don't know if that fully answers your question, but. No, that, that's really good stuff. I think that, that's a good point. Um, well, let's talk about the data mesh and the open data lake house. I mean, we, how does how do those fit together? Um, you know, these distributed environments with versus the idea of trying to centralize. Yeah, so if one of the things I, I've been advising quite a few companies on is like, what's the journey to a lake house anyway? And I actually put data mesh in the middle of that journey. So as I mentioned earlier, it's like the first step is federation, right? Connecting all those data sources. The second then is where everybody likes to try to start, which is that, you know, the modern, you know, data stack, right? And I, half the room will go, that doesn't exist. The other half the room goes, I can tell you with bias what I would bring in if I could choose my data stack tomorrow. Right. Um, so, and then the third step being the lake house. But I think that second and third is that iterative space of going, how do I exist in here? Right. Let's be honest, like even with Dremio, we don't have, like, you're not going to be able to connect every single data source and every single catalog and every single part of your ecosystem in. Right. Now, we're the only one that allows you to connect on prem and cloud based to be hybrid. But again, being able to connect all of your data and serve all those insights to one place, like it's just it's just not going to happen, right? So if you think yeah. about data mesh as principles of delivering value into main ownership, yeah, now how do I do that better, right? So I may land the data with now Fivetran into an S3 bucket, but I still have all of my on-prem systems and Teradata and or like, you may not want to mm -hmm. move all of that. Um, you may want to let those, you know, those operational areas stay there and continue to modernize with your key transformation and it's just, so you don't bog down the team. Uh, so I think, you know, as you move into that lake house, now you're thinking about, well, can I apply these principles of an open architecture, best of breed tools, mm -hmm. right? data as code? Absolutely. But that becomes a journey. So I like to tell folks is like lake house fits within a mesh ecosystem, just like it fits within a fabric ecosystem, right? But it, it doesn't mean that every single thing in your lake house is part of your mesh or, you know, is the whole mesh mesh itself is a principle, just like, you know, data, um, modernization, right. And just like you, you deal with agile, right. Who's fully agile again, mesh is mm -hmm. mesh those core principles. So I like to say a, a solid mesh and a high performance mesh will have a lake house architecture deployed in it. 
which makes you know the total cost of ownership of your ecosystem frankly pay for a lot of itself mm -hmm. yeah i think that's a great point that it's a journey and uh, you know you're never going to have 100 percent of an open data lake house i mean it might be great but um so yeah there's always well, been well, yeah my favorite example if i can give you one is actually when i was at zendesk um i had a a product use case where we went to do product analytics and i was asked like, hey, for these top four use cases this year, can we deliver them? And I'm like, well, all of our product interactions in AWS, all of our business mm -hmm. intelligence and models and outputs and so forth are all in GCP. In order to meet yeah. one of those use cases, I had to have 50 terabytes of data move every single day from AWS into GCP. Wow. And I'm like, there's just got to be a better way, right? <laughs> um, and I think this is where that lake house becomes like really powerful going, Imagine if part of my queries to be able to answer that use case is only hitting 5% of that table in AWS, and I'm hitting 80% of those tables in GCP. And oh, by the way, my query costs less than the Tableau dashboard I run every morning that says what our sales was yesterday. Hmm. And I think that's the piece of like Lakehouse enables that. Mesh allows you to go, great, and I can deliver that in 30 days and not six months because I don't have to move all that data into one location. And I know exactly who owns it. Yeah, you know, you know better uh, who you're delivering it to, and and uh, using the data product or data as a product principles. Yeah. So maybe talk about um, <clears throat> the journey. I mean, you've had experiences that you were talking about. Um, what are some of the lessons learned um, and best practices that you recommend in the data mesh journey? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that we've we've seen at Dremio. Um, as much as we, we love Lake House, right, and trying to push folks, I, it really comes back to most people are landing at that federation piece. Um, hmm. And then it's like, okay, great, now that I can do this and I applied some of these principles, how do I continue now to drive transformation as I'm agnosticating the back end architecture, right? The business just wants insights. Like yeah. they don't necessarily need direct access to these sources. What they need is to solve a business problem. So, as much hmm. as they talk about tech, if you can solve a business problem, they're happy. Um, so I think on the other side, that how you now solve that problem and deliver it faster becomes super unique. And I think I gave the example earlier with MSK, you know, they just wanted to be able to give access to their research organization data faster. And they had copies of everywhere and it's hard to govern, right? And they just looked at Dremio and said, hey, can you at least allow us to federate and do these things without having everybody constantly downloading and sharing Excel files, right? You don't, you don't want your family's data there. Uh, <laughs> Now, the cool part is we delivered that very fast, but what they ended up seeing is, again, like 90% reduction in a Kafka spend. And the time to, to deliver that, like Regeneron is a similar example in the same space, you know, they went from months to quarters at times being able to deliver data to a business user, uh, months while prioritizing quarters when not, um, to days to weeks. And I think now the fun question is like, now what would you do with that, right? No one's going to give back for engineers headcount. Um, mm -hmm. And I think Shell is my favorite example here uh, where, you know, they found 14 data engineer worth of efficiencies within the first year of deploying Dremio, mm -hmm. moving into these types of, of architectures. And what they ended up doing with the same foundation was delivering customer 360. Right? So they were solving the renewable energy problem with a new business line, with Dremio's new pattern. But what they ended up seeing was, well, the efficiencies we gain versus what we budgeted, we can actually go after a whole other piece of our foundation. Uh, That's great. So I think this is the part of the, it, it, well, how do you continue to leverage the foundation that you're delivering to drive even more mm -hmm. transformation into the business? So if I give you back 14 engineers tomorrow, what would you do with them? Um, and I think yeah. getting intentional about that becomes super fun. And you go, I can really transform not just how the business, but, you know, if I was able to do this at another company in my past, I won't say who, because it would make my uh, my counterparts feel bad. You know, we had over 1,600, almost 1,700 pager duty tickets just around data movement alone in a quarter. A quarter. Hmm. If I gave you back 1,200 pager duty tickets, how would you feel? Um, so I think these are the things of when you're on the journey, it's thinking about like, I'm deploying these best practices, but again, it's got to drive some business value. And it's always got to start there. And when you finish there and you have better relationships and with the business, you also have better impact in your own team. And you mentioned, I mean, I like your concept of the, the North Star, you know, um, is it in that journey to important to have that North Star kind of in mind as you're 
both in the technical and business sense, I guess, because obviously the business sense is really solving the problems. Yeah, that's, and honestly, a good chunk of my time is basically still doing the field CDO type of role where I've, I've gone in mm -hmm. with teams and it's like, well, how do you help educate the patterns that we're talking about? And what I normally tell them is the easiest way to do that is just really thinking about, you know, and grabbing on to a couple key patterns that are going to drive true transformation within the business. So how do you get out of those conversations around speeds and feeds, right? And platform versus platform. If you make it about the transformation piece itself to go, Hey, if I deliver this customer 360, what, what next best message can I give to a customer? Right. And then you sit here and go, well, what about next best product? Well, I need that customer 360 foundation to do the product 360 foundation. And then, and then, and then, so like, but these things all continue to, to roll on with, with each other. And you just continue to build out that foundation to drive towards enterprise level transformation while you're driving architecture. Because my fun comment is no one ever funds architecture. Stop going in talking speeds and feeds, right? And talk about the transformation you're going to drive with the business by doing things a better way. Um, and my, I had a really cool business partner once tell me, look, I don't care if you do mesh. I don't care if you do fabric. I don't care if you, like, I don't care. How are you going to give me data faster? Mm -hmm. Whatever way you're going to do that, that's what I want you to do is stop talking about all this other stuff. And <laughs> Call it I think that was will. a great lesson learned that I continue to try to share every meeting I have is it's not about the platform. It's about the transformation you're driving or frankly to go, you know, like Maersk, I can give you back $4 million in your supply chain this year. Cool. It's worth a, you know, a quick contract to say, prove it. Um, and we did right within, within months, they saved $4 million in their bill. And now they have less pager duty tickets, right? Less complexity in their architecture and more flexibility. And I think that's the part of, you don't lead with the second part, you lead with the first, whether it's the business or you go, hey, I can give you a customer 360 while delivering this other thing at the same price. Mm -hmm. And I think it, <clears throat> that product thinking, the idea of next best, that, that's an interesting thought in terms of thinking of data products that way. So the user experience, um, I mean, close our discussion with that before we get to the audience questions, we did see that 55% or, you know, a good share uh, want to enable users to easily access, query, and analyze distributed data. Uh, so how about making the user experience easier to accomplish those things? Um, what are you seeing is important there? Yeah. Again, I, I think it's also pushing on who's the user. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think initially when we talk about these platforms or patterns or otherwise, we talk about the data engineer. Uh, we may talk about the analyst, right? And I think the real North Star here is to go, what about the not 40 or 400 engineers in the company? What about the 4,000 to 40,000 employees in the company? How do we yeah. actually truly create citizens analysts that don't break things, <laughs> right? Or citizens data scientists without knowing they're a data scientist. And I think all the innovations around like Gen AI, for example, makes that much easier. Now the question becomes like, how do you pro continue to provide that in a very easy consumable space in the same platforms that people want to use that are hardcore engineers that don't want to touch a UI and just play at the CLI level or an API. Um, hmm. So I think a lot of the platforms is like, well, let's really be clear about what we mean as a user and what we mean as success. Do you want to kill the pager duty tickets or do you actually want to kill the initial question that came in driving it? Hmm. Uh, and the answer on those is sometimes is, you know, yes and no, or no and yes. Um, so it's really just what does success look like? And again, business backwards. Yeah, and I think that takes some experience to know what that success looks like too. <clears throat> Sometimes it's, it's sort of an evolving definition, I guess you could say. Well, that's why community is so important too. Uh, if you can learn from other people's failures, um, yeah. you know, you can always move forward faster too. Well, thanks, Nick. I think on that, uh, Andrew, I'm going to hand it back to you for audience Q&A. Yeah, absolutely. That was a great conversation. Thank you both. Uh, we'll jump into the audience questions here. So, uh, Nick, we'll start with you on this. Of course, Dave, if you have something to add, please do so. Uh, okay, so Nick, here's the question. We have a hybrid multi-cloud data environment and have trouble enabling complete data access and governance. What would be the best strategy going forward to get more value out of the data? Would that be a data mesh or a data fabric? Yeah, so I... I'll maybe stay away from the mesh fabric part and go, this is why I think the pattern is so important, right? So in hybrid environments, again, you're not going to deprecate your cloud-based store, uh, your, uh, your on-prem storage, right? There's a path there, but it's not tomorrow. 
So I think these are where the federation capabilities become so important to go, how do I register that data quickly, uh, make it visible, accessible, and then go, what is now the path to be able to move that, right? So can I just move it to an object store versus object store to Snowflake, right? Or do I want to rethink about how we're actually storing data in general across the whole ecosystem? So part of this is like, what is the pattern in, that you want to be able to deploy in your ecosystem? And then how fast can you start proving the value of that pattern? I think these are where things like Lake House become so powerful. Now, Fabric in that type of answer, right, is, is going to get you in a lot of trouble to start with. This is why I say Fabric's a North Star. Because otherwise, you're probably only out there looking at like a Denodo. Um, that's going to take you two years to deploy. It's going to be very expensive and hard to manage. Um, where I'd say like Mesh, you can go, yeah, I can light up those services uh, and the data in there tomorrow. Now, how you manage that and govern that is the fun next part to go, do I need full isolation of this environment? Is, is my organization too risk adverse to be able to have all of that run in one cluster, right? Let alone is that cluster performant enough? So how you now set up your implementation, I think that's a little bit more solution architecture than reference architecture. But again, depending on your company's um, tolerance for risk or lack thereof, um, it's, it's a really a matter of deployment patterns and then isolation. And I think that's where Mesh is pretty cool to go, how do I essentially even manage, uh, we call it like a Dremio to Dremio connector, you know, deploying Dremio for your on-prem services, deploying Dr another version of Dremio within for all of your cloud sources, but having a connector across both of those. So research, which may only need to be able to be on-prem, can access all the data not, but it's not even visible to everybody uh, on the cloud side. So again, a lot of it's deployment patterns, but having, again, consistency on how you're doing your auth zen and auth z, or you know, your, your access and governance side, that's going to be core. And that, that cuts across whether you're doing mesh fabric or not. I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think that was great. <clears throat> I'll try and squeeze one last question in here. I know we're running short on time. Uh, okay, so Nick, to enable data as a product, where do you see the advance coming on the data marketplaces? Oh, that's a good one. Um, and I would probably push everyone here utilizing or putting any data into marketplace. Um, the fun question you're going to have is back to that data as a product. Data products can exist in the marketplace, but what does it mean to create to manage data as a product? So being able to know how am I actually managing this data? Can I rely on it every single day I'm using it? Can my customers rely on it, right? If you're monetizing yourself into a marketplace, um, you know, how am I looking at change management of that data and its continued maturation? What about simple things that, that people don't track, which is like metadata drift, uh, not just data drift, but the metadata drift. And then the impact downstream on the model drift that's even running over top of it, depending on how complex the data is in that marketplace. So marketplaces are awesome, right? I think everybody started doing COVID responses because of you know Hopkins putting out all the COVID information into marketplace and we all modeled off of it. The fun question starts to be the, the impact of multi-models and those final tables from everybody that's, that's serving that data. Can you continuously rely on it and assure that it's secure? Um, so I, I think, you know, diving into that is definitely fun. And whoever asked that, feel free to add me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to, to shoot more uh, back and forth on it. I agree. Okay, That's well, a great unfortunately, question. this does. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Dave. Sorry. Go ahead, Andrew. Sure. Um, I was going to mention that we have unfortunately ran out of time. <laughs> so uh, I would like to thank our speakers. We did, of course, hear from David Stoddard with TDWI, Nick Atchison with Dremio. I uh, would also like to thank Dremio once again for sponsoring today's webinar. Uh, I would also like to thank the audience for asking the questions. I know we didn't get to all of them, but we'll try and get these questions over to Nick, and, and um, perhaps he might be able to answer these offline. Lastly, from all of us here, let me say thank you so much for attending. This does conclude today's event.